Hey everybody, I am Dr. Heather Flexer with Better Wounds and today I'm joined by uh, with Dr. Kitty Adderley. She's with Handling Your Health Rehab and Wellness and from the Bahamas. Thank you Kitty for joining me. Um, it is my pleasure. <laughs> so it is National Diabetes Awareness Month and I wanted to talk to you about diabetes because you're a diabetic educator now. Mm -hmm. But also how that ties in with lymphedema because I know you're a lymphedema specialist. So mm -hmm. am I crazy to think that that this might affect people? <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. So um, it's it's all convoluted, right? Um, so what do we so, talk about first? So the diabetes, or do we talk about the lymphedema? <laughs> so let's start with diabetes. Right, let's uh -huh. say someone knows they have diabetes or maybe doesn't know they have diabetes, but uh -huh. they have diabetes. Um, and would that, would diabetes alone create lymphedema? Um, I, I don't wanna say yes, mm -hmm. but there are no hard and fast rules, right? So okay. one of the things, one of the side effects that we know are complications of diabetes, it's changing, it changes in the arteries and the veins. Um, and when you have changes in your veins, you lose motoricity in the valves. And you can have what we call reflux, where there is fluid buildup in the legs. We, we tend to see it more in the legs, um, and that can cause a buildup of fluid. Now, if that fluid stays there for about 30 days or more, that becomes chronic swelling. And now that's the terminology now that's been given to lymphedema, that if you have swelling present for more than 30 days, it's considered chronic swelling or lymphedema. Now, the other thing is, is that usually when people are diabetic, um, not usually, we see in the, di in, in the diabetic population that physical activity decreases significantly for various reasons. One, they may feel fatigued. Um, the challenges of balancing blood sugar makes them uneasy, so they don't want to exercise and overexert themselves. Um, they usually are overweight. So all of these things lend to physical, a decrease in physical activity. The lower extremity needs physical activity specifically to help with good venous return and lymphatic return. So you need the pumping mechanisms of the muscles to help with the return of fluid. And this is one of the reasons why you can possibly see an increase in the diabetic population when it comes to lower extremity swelling and lymphedema. But they could just have how does someone develop lymphedema normally so <laughs> normally Ooh, normally okay. like so we it have doesn't just like happen right well it could just happen but why 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 does it happen uh -huh. so in in the world of lymphedema we have two types we have a primary lymphedema and we have a secondary lymphedema in primary lymphedema it means that your body has a default it has a fault so either you don't have um, lymph nodes in the particular area, you don't have good um, lymph vessels in a particular area, and um, that causes um, poor, poor transport of the lymphatics, the lymphatic, the lymph fluid. And so we have in primary lymphedema what we call um, lymphedema precoxia that usually happens before the age of 35, and then you have the lymphedema tarda that happens after the age of 35. So um, poor lymphatics, poor polyform lymphatics, abs an absence in lymphatic, and it can happen. And then in the TADA later on, it's usually hormonal driven. So you would see it in women that may have had pregnancy or some other hormonal shift that can present with the swelling and lymphedema. So that's primary lymphedema. Okay. When we move to secondary lymphedema, the reason why we call it secondary is because there is some insult or assault to the lymphatic system. So how I became a lymphatic um, certified lymphedema therapist is because I worked in a hospital where we were getting these cancer survivors and these survivors were presenting with swelling after cancer intervention, after the radiation, after the surgery was performed to remove the cancer and the diseased tissue, which included lymphatic, the lymph nodes for a lot of times. These patients were presenting with swelling and swelling that we couldn't seem to manage from our conventional way they taught us in physio school, right? Mm -hmm. And so I decided, look, we need to get to the bottom of this because what's the point of increasing somebody's life span 
and the quality of life is significantly impeded because they're swollen, bloated, and cannot move, cannot wear the clothes that they want to do. So that's one cause of secondary lymphedema, where you have radiation or surgery to the particular node area, okay? Um, I've had patients that have had car accidents, motorcycle accidents, that have had crush injuries to the legs that have developed lymphedema. I've had patients that have had reg, um, thyroid surgery. Um, mm -hmm. If it's a tumor, they, like again, lymphatics have been removed. Um, obesity is another reason some people have developed lymph lymphedema. Like I said, if you have a venous reflux, Mm -hmm. where the vein, the venous return is not as regular as it should be. It's going to pool, it's going to pocket, it's going to leak out and stay in the tissues, and it's going to overload the lymphatic system. Mm -hmm. So the lymphatic system is only supposed to take back about 10% of that blood volume or what's, what's, what's extracted from that circulation. But when you have a venous backup, that's overloading the lymphatic system and everything just just collapses for lack of a Shuts better down. word. Yeah. And you have, right. You have that pooling of fluid in the, in the body part. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if anyone doesn't know, one of the hallmarks of lymphedema treatment is compression, right? We've got to mm -hmm. compress the tissue, like not allow it to just expand and expand and expand. We want it to keep its shape, right? And help that venous return. It helps all of it. Like that compression is one of our treatments for venous insufficiency, but it's also, right the treatment for lymphedema. Is that appropriate for someone that's diabetic? It depends on the person's presentation. And when I say presentation, it's the, um, the, the skin. What is the okay. patient's skin like? Now with diabetes, there is a hallmark of neuropathy where you have decreased or altered sensation. So if this person does not have intact or they have poor sensation, we'll be very cautious of how we wrap. It's not that we won't wrap, but we would probably be not as aggressive as we would with somebody who has intact sensation. Mm -hmm. Because with compression, it's, it's not a tight compression, but because of the way the bandages may lie at a particular time or the movement of the person, you can have um, undue pressure on a particular point. And if this person's sensation is not intact enough to register that something, the skin is being damaged, that can be an issue. Mm -hmm. So we're more cautious when it comes to patients that are diabetic and have impaired um, sensation. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. So you are either checking them more often, like having them come back, right? So that's something that if you're wrapping someone or you're getting wrapped, <laughs> you want extra someone padding. to look, extra padding, yeah. mm -hmm. or the toes purple, <laughs> right? right? Or the garment that we would choose or the compression alternatively, something that we can pull off easy and put on easy. Mm -hmm. It may not be the complex multi-layer bandaging system that we, you know, that we used initially when we first started with compression. We now have fantastic compression alternatives on the market and that might be something we would go for, something quick and easy where we can um, lift, lift a flap and see what the skin looks like and then put it back down and everything's okay. And that way the patient and their, co their caregiver can monitor, you know, skin integrity a lot easier. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what mm -hmm. about now, um, diabetics have to do finger sticks regularly or, you know, they're wearing the insulin pumps. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that at all come across with any of your lymphedema folks? I can't say that I've had. Okay. Um, I can't say that because most people wear their palms either on their tummy or in the back of their arms. Yeah. And like you said, most of the times we see the lymphedema or the swelling in the lower extremities, in the legs. Yeah. Um, but it would be something to, to note. Um, very few people, I mean, they may put, um, what do you say, test, take blood samples from their thighs and abdomen. Um, but I, I can't say that I have, I know that it would probably, you can, you can have not lymphedema, but if you traumatize the tissue, it'll give you an inflammatory response and that area might get a little swollen, 
a little stiff, a little stagnant. So it's good to teach diabetics how to flush people with diabetes, how to flush an area that they mm -hmm. do constant prick from because each, each stick is a little assault on the area and the body's going to think that that's an injury and send extra fluid there to ward off the area and all of that. And this is why um, a lot of them would complain that, you know, wherever I stick myself, I have a lot of lumps in my tummy or I have a little lumps in my thighs. And just teaching them what we call manual lymphatic drainage or manual lymphatic strokes would help with moving that fluid out of the area and just okay. keep them more aware of how their body is responding to the constant pricking that is necessary in some cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, I mean, like anything, we're always talking about getting to the bottom if, you know, if we're talking about wounds is, is what causes it. So, of course, we're hoping people are getting on top of managing their diabetes, getting their sugar right. under control, is that, and then noticing if they're having any of the chronic swelling and trying to get into, you know, a certified lymphedema therapist, absolutely. Definitely, and, and here's the interesting part, Heather, what we don't speak enough about. So say that you may be pre-diabetic, right? Your HbA1c may be borderline 6, 6.5, um, they don't want to give you a formal diagnosis of diabetes. Um, people that have chronic swelling in their lower extremities have to be very, very careful of chronic swelling anywhere. Because with chronic swelling, you're having more fluid and it's very hard to regulate blood sugar when there's extra fluid. And so these people have to be very, very vigilant in monitoring blood sugar, the blood glucose levels, because there can be shifts. And I don't think we stress that enough with people that have swelling and people that may be at high risk for diabetes. And so you want to pay careful attention to that. And high risk people are people that are over 45. If you have a family history, um, we know that people of African descent, um, specific a Pacific a um, Asians, Islanders, I'm sorry, um, Native Americans have a higher incidence or uh, uh, predisposition to have um, diabetes, if you have, I said family history, mm -hmm. um, if you smoke, if you have cardiovascular disease, if overweight. you don't move, right, mm -hmm. if you're overweight, these are risk factors. So if you tick any of those boxes and all of us are getting older, you want to pay close attention to what your blood sugar levels are like and what your HbA1c is. And pay attention to both numbers because sometimes, you know, uh, the, when you take your, your readings, it might be a whim and one may be high or one may be low today and it may flip flop. So you have to be very vigilant and you have to take very, you have to be very attentive to everything, your skin, the way your joints move, the way your body moves, the way you breathe, the way you feel. Mm -hmm. And I've definitely mm -hmm. seen, um, more chronic swelling that's like people aren't necessarily being referred to a, a lymphedema therapy. Like I've been the one to tell people first that they have what looks like to be the beginning of lymphedema. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, this doesn't look right. You need to go back to your doctor and get a referral to a, a, a lymphedema therapist. And I'm like, just yeah. do it. <laughs> Because they're all booked out so far in advance, but any of that like chronic tingling, swelling, it, it feels heavy, it feels weird. Like if you've had surgery, if you have diabetes, if you mm -hmm. um, have been through a procedure, an accident, and that's like a, a pervasive like feeling in your limb, mm -hmm. just go get the extra help if you don't have it and you don't need the therapy. Like fantastic, but people wait forever, don't get. It's so much they easier do. to treat early than it is to treat when it's it. They do. Chronic. And so I'm glad that we're doing this because one of the challenges that we have as certified lymphedema therapist is number one, people don't truly understand what it is that we do. Um, and they confuse lymphatic massage with manual lymphatic drainage or they confuse it with complete decongestive therapy mm -hmm. and complete decongestive therapy is a four component treatment where we start off with education what you and I are doing now what to look for check, taking care of your skin what to eat 
right? Mm -hmm. The second part of it is the manual lymphatic drainage. We want you to know what you're getting into. You have to be committed to this because usually chronic swelling can be a lifelong um, presentation and you have to be able to manage it. So we want to educate you so you can self-manage. The manual lymphatic drainage is a specified manual therapy technique that targets the lymphatic system. Mm -hmm. There is a sequence to it, depending on where the presentation of the swelling is. It's not an ad hoc, let me rub you from head to toe to get the fluid moving. Because I, I've, I've heard a lot of people try and get um, manual lymph lymphatic massage. And when they come to me, they're like, well, they didn't do it that way. And, but we get the results right away because this is the way it's supposed to be done. So you have yeah. to make sure that you're going to a certified lymphedema therapist that should be a medical professional. If you have a medical issue, a medical professional. All right, can't stress that enough. So we have education, we have manual lymphatic drainage, and then it's the compression that you and I spoke about earlier on. Whether it's multi-layer compression bandaging, whether it's a compression alternative in terms of one of these nice doohickeys that they have now with the straps and the Velcro, Yep. Or it could be a compression sock or compression sleeve that is measured specifically for your body part. We talked about obese patients. We know some people have very tiny ankles and very large thighs. And what would happen is that they would go to a pharmacy and somebody would pull something off the shelf and give it to them. And because it fits the ankle and it fits the knee, but it doesn't fit the thigh. And then it becomes a tourniquet effect. Like I'm a physical therapist, I'm a manual therapist. And if you look at my arms, I have huge arms, right? <laughs> so, and I have a tiny wrist. I don't fit an off the shelf sleeve. If I need a compression sleeve, it needs to be custom fitted. And mm -hmm. I'm considered regular. Do you understand? Yeah. So it depends on your body type, your body makeup. And we're seeing some people worse than their lymphedema because they're wearing ill-fitting garments. So that's the compression. And the last part, the fourth component of this um, complete decongestive therapy is having a structured, what we call remedial exercises to help with the lymphatic flow. And that's usually done with your compression garment on because you want to enhance your circulation. You want to enhance your venous return. You want to enhance your lymphatic return. And it's so important. So the four components, education and skin care, manual lymphatic drainage, compression therapy, therapeutic remedial exercises. That is essential for managing efficiently lymphedema and chronic edema. Absolutely. And if you go to someone and they start rubbing you and they start at your feet, get out of there. Run. They're they're not doing it right. They run, should not start run. at the toes. Run. I know. I know. Yeah. So I, it's important because a lot of our physicians aren't even aware of what we do. Right. Yeah, yeah. They're like, oh, go go and get a compression sock or go and get a compression sleeve. I have people call me all the time because we I sell the garments. I'm a certified fitter. For most of the um, companies, Jobs, Juzo, and um, you know, I get the call. Or what, the doctor says I need a sleeve. I said, Well, you need to come in so I can evaluate you. Oh no, I just, I just need a sleeve. I just, I just saw the doctor. I don't need an evaluation. But I'm like, What stage of lymphedema are you in? And they're like, What stage? I'm like, Yes, we have different stages. Are yeah. you in active swelling? Are you, this is your your plateau or what we call your regular state now? And they can't answer that question and because they haven't been informed. And I can tell you I've lost customers because I won't sell a sleeve just because they ask for a sleeve. Most of them can't fit in a custom, uh, in an off the shelf garment. They need to be measured and custom fitted and have that garment made specifically for them. Mm. Or they need to be treated for active lymphedema. I have people coming in here in stage three. I mean, fibrotic changes, orange skin. Sometimes they have cracks in their skin. You know, you don't need to be in a sleeve. You need to be treated and, and properly trained how to take care of this body that you have. And so educating our physicians and educating our other um, medical colleagues is very mm -hmm. important. I talk to the pharmacists all the time because they're the ones that stock the, the garments. Look, don't just sell a sleeve. I know you're trying to make a sale, but you can worsen the program, right? Mm -hmm. Diabetic educators now, they're, they have their eyes out for when we see these changes. You know, oh, the patient will tell you, well, my foot was always swollen. Well, you had the problem for a long time. <laughs> oh, my you mother's feet were swollen. Primary lymphedema, you know, that sounds like, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, oh, you know, we just, I just have big legs. No, boo-boo, no. <laughs> we, 
we need to get to the root of this. You have big legs with pitting edema. There's something wrong here. And I really want to stress too why it's important to take care of the skull and specifically in the legs because we talked about physical activity and mobility. Mm -hmm. When you have prolonged swelling, lymphedema fluid is a high protein fluid. So it's sticky. It sticks to things that's in the area. And you know, the foot's very complex. Lots of bones, lots of ligaments in that area. If there's a lot of swelling in that area, that high protein fluid is going to cause things to stick. So you lose the flexibility of the foot. You lose the, the strength of a lot of the muscles because the muscles don't know what to do. They're just sitting there in all this fluid. So what happens now is that you have something that sets the sequelae for pain. If I don't feel like moving because of pain, I get stiff. I'm already stiff because the protein's sticking it down. Then I find different ways to walk because I just need to move without aggravating the pain. Then you start having foot dysfunction. And we know with diabetes that one of the things that comes along, complications that come along with that is foot, foot, foot deformities. So yeah. having swelling superimposed on a diabetic foot is not a good thing. Having swelling in the foot period is a bad thing. But now superimposed on a foot that may be neuropathic, um, with nerve issues that, you know, all kinds of other stuff is going on. You do not want that. So if you're mm -hmm. diabetic and you're swollen in the feet, get it addressed properly so we can prolong good foot health, mm -hmm. good mobility, and keep you moving. Absolutely. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, Kitty. This is so important. So many people need to hear this. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to share real quick? Um, Where can no, people I find you? <laughs> Where are you on social media? <laughs> so on social media, I am handling your health, wellness and rehab. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter. I think Twitter, we're HYH wellness, but everything else is handling your health. Um, you can reach out to me. Um, I have a Facebook page, Dr. Kitty Bonet, Roll Adley. You can reach out to me there. Or if you just type in Kitty Bonet, K-I-T-I-B-O-N-I, -I, I think there are only two of us on Facebook, maybe three <laughs> now. I'm the only girl. The other two, are, the other two are guys. <laughs> but you just type that in, Physio Kitty. I should pop up, and I'm always happy to help. I do televisits, um, so telemedicine visits, telehealth visits. So if you have questions, you want to talk more about what's going on, we can definitely do that. There are some fantastic resources. There are a lot of self-teaching tools that we can do. Um, sorry, tools for self-help that we can teach tongue twister. Um, but I'm here and I'm available at all times. Well, oh. not all times. Don't call yeah. me two o'clock in let, the morning. <laughs> let her sleep. Let her sleep. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Heather. <laughs>